popular fish around the world. There are hundreds of web pages you can read up on, from how to care for the koi to societies of koi lovers. Tony Lee goes to the Koi Hotel every other day to visit his fish. He spends nearly three and a half thousand US dollars a month on food and rent for the 100 koi he owns. They are living the good life in total pampered comfort at the Nippon Koi Hotel. Tony's own pond at home is not big enough to keep them all together. They need plenty of room to swim and exercise. Just look how big they get. Tony Lee is not alone in his preoccupations, and that's why Ah Seng opened the hotel. Many people love fish, but can't house them because their homes are too small or their relatives don't share their tastes. Ah Seng says that some guys rent space in the hotel for their koi to stop their wives from seeing how much money they really spend on the fish. Nippon Koi Hotel has about 100 customers. The hotel has about 200 ponds in three different sizes from small to huge. The latter are known as the presidential suites of ponds. Each of them comes with a room or pond number and the koi lovers can keep a record of their pets shapes and sizes. The koi hotel's ponds cost between 130 and 400 US dollars a month. The high-end presidential investment ponds are for serious breeders who raise koi to sell them at auction or to enter them in competitions. Some ponds are deeper than others. Koi breeders say the deeper the pond, the bigger the fish. Public relations consultant Tai Ka Yang fell in love with the koi 12 years ago. Today he owns about 80 of them. He sends them to the hotel to grow larger in the bigger ponds. Tay says he's too busy at work to tend to his fish. The Koi Hotel is just perfect for him. They help us to monitor the fish, so if anything is wrong, be it health or that it needs a little more pampering, we certainly get that from the Koi Hotel, he said. The hotel also provides hospital services for sick koi that are suffering from skin disease. The most common sickness is ulcers caused by bad water. Koi lovers say the fish even suffer from stress caused by travelling from one pond to another. The hotel also caters for people who want to board their koi for short stays when they go away on holidays or in between moving house. The hotel owners say the hotel is not only for serious koi lovers and breeders. They encourage beginners to start collecting them and simply appreciate the beauty of the fish at the hotel or at home. These pets won't exactly fetch a ball for you, but they are guaranteed to provide you with some entertainment. In the hands of this master glass blower, Bob Harris, Glass is flexible and practical, providing laboratory hardware for a variety of scientific experiments. Using a lathe, hydrogen burners and a carbon tool for shaping, he skillfully works his magic. He says it's simply a matter of understanding the glass and its movements, both with your eyes and your hands, and be able to manipulate between the two. Bob has been building one-of-a-kind components for spacecraft and laboratory experiments for over 20 years. As a scientific glass blower, Bob has been asked to build just about everything, from springs and laser tubes to the main vacuum chamber for an atomic clock. The art of scientific glass blowing is really only learned from watching an expert at work, and that's the way it's been for centuries. Unaffected by most chemicals and able to withstand extreme temperatures, glass is perfect for chemistry hardware. For scientists, the skill and experience of an on-site craftsman provide important design flexibility. This piece will be a part of a large-scale ozone depletion study at the Centre of Research Lab. A piece of research apparatus begins to take shape. By forcing air into the closed vessel and heating only a tiny area, a blister is formed. Using the torch like a knife, Bob cuts a hole. Tubing is then inserted to form a joint. Once completed, the arm is heated and with a quick bend, it's finished. 
At the Atmospheric Research Lab, Bob presents his work to Dr. Steph. The new glassware is easily added. Collaboration between scientists and craftsmen often extends beyond glass blowing to include the machine shop or optical section. This mirror, two years in the making by the optical lab, is being checked for surface imperfection. In their free time, researchers, craftsmen and scientists alike turn from space flight research to flight testing on a smaller scale. This hobby has helped Bob discover new talents. He explains that he took his scientific glass blowing, his artistic abilities and his modelling background and combined them all into what everyone sees today, his glass satellites. Delicate glass sculptures have been created for exhibits as well as for national and international leaders to represent NASA's space achievements. Each of them carefully constructed using techniques perfected through years of scientific work. Glass blowing, mixing centuries of old craftsmanship with the vital scientific needs of today. There's something smelly going on in the USA. A science centre is hosting an exhibit that teaches kids how and why their bodies burp, vomit, make bogies and pass gas through sight, sound and smell. Snot, gas, burping and vomit. That's what the exhibit Grossology, the impolite science of the human body, promises to teach kids. And kids are lapping up the information. The Liberty Science Centre is hosting the Gross Out exhibit. Children can interact with the displays by climbing up a pimply wall, listen to a tap dripping green stuff while talking about boogers, and travelling through a maze of intestines only to exit out the rectum. It's designed for under 12 year olds who enter the exhibit through a giant nose allowing kids to feel mucus and learn that humans swallow a lot of mucus every day. The kids are also encouraged to slide down the esophagus, tunnel through the intestine and slip out of the colon. Fact sheets along the way teach kids such things as Did you know you shed almost 2 million skin cells every hour? And Did you know that rhinotelexamonia is the study of nose picking? It may not teach too much about biology, but it does stoke the interest in science by appealing to the fascination of bathroom humour. Easily the grossest display is the section on smells, challenging kids to smell four different hideous pongs and then guess whether it comes from the armpit, mouth, anus or foot. Kids can also fire pollen balls into nostrils to demonstrate the effect of pollen on the nasal system. Shoot five right up the nose and a ball of mucus comes flying right back at you. There is a serious side though, with grossology not only encouraging an interest in biology, but also a confidence in their own bodies. I'm sure you've heard of a house auction, even a furniture auction, but what about a rhino auction? The annual event held at Kazulu, Natal Province recently saw close to 1,800 animals, including more than 70 rhinos, sold. It raised almost 22 million rand for conservation projects and community development. A group of six rare black rhinos fetched a record 550,000 rand. That's 68 and a half thousand US dollars each. They were purchased by a German bidder operating a private game reserve in South Africa. The animals, which included several species of antelope, ostriches and warthogs, are caught on the province nature and game reserve and sold to private operators in the ecotourism sector. The buyers included owners of private nature and safari reserves, as well as an outfitter who runs hunting operations on game farms.
a white rhino and her calf fetched a record 550,000 rand at the sale, beating the previous record for a similar pair which went for 450,000 rand at last year's auction. About 350 animals, including 50 of the rhinos, were caught in advance and live auction, giving the prospective buyer the opportunity to view them in their holding pens. Live video footage of the animals from the holding pens was beamed onto the big screen behind the auctioneer. The 550,000 rand bid per Black Rhino drew a round of huge applause from the bidders and spectators. White and Black Rhinos are actually both grey. White Rhinos are larger and greys, while Black Rhinos have a hook lip used for browsing. Virtually all of Southern Africa's White Rhino population come from the KwaZulu Natal which was the last refuge of the huge beasts earlier in the century when they were on the brink of extinction. It's a breeding program that saved the animals and the reserve has restocked other parks throughout the region. On a more serious note now, an international animal rights group has demanded better protection for the endangered Tibetan antelope. They have been brought to the brink of extinction due to the demand for its shatush wool. Shatush, which is Persian, means from nature and fit for a king, and has long been acknowledged as the king of wool. Conservationists warned recently that the growing trade in shatush wool was becoming an increasing threat to the endangered Tibetan antelope. Only an estimated 75,000 remain in the world. Since the 1980s, chateau shawls have become a must-have item among the rich and fashionable, despite a ban on its international trade since 1979. In India and America, the purchase and sale of the shawls is illegal and carries a maximum prison term of seven years in India. The wool is so fine it measures just three quarts the width of Kashmir and one fifth that of human hair. Chatushi smuggled into Kashmir to be woven into shawls and scarves. Zhao Xingzong of the China Environmental Scientists Association said conservation groups and ordinary people were united in their opposition to the trade. The coats of between three and five Tibetan antelope are needed for a single shawl, which can cost up to 5,000 US dollars. Demand is keen all over the world, especially in major fashion centres in France, Italy and Britain, and buyers are known to fly regularly to Delhi for private showings. We really need to ask, is fashion really worth the life of such a beautiful creature, or worse, the existence of a species? Scooping water from a hand-dug well and trekking miles with it back to the village. It's a daily chore for millions in Africa. Yet clean water can often be found only a few metres underground. The problem is getting the water out. Drilling a well can cost up to 10,000 pounds sterling. This newly developed hand-operated hammer drill can sink a well in Africa at the tenth of that price. Members of a research team at Cranfield University just outside London design the new tool. As the pipe is hammered through the rock, clay and sand to the water below, new sections can be screwed on. All parts of the rig except the super hard drill bit are designed to be made or bought locally, removing the need for costly imported spares. And there is no patent on the design. That means anyone can modify it to make it work more effectively. 
It might take two weeks to drill the well depending on the depth of the water table. Then a simple hand pump like this can be fitted to provide a permanent water supply to the village. The drill has already been tested in various sites in Uganda, where the government is part funding the project. If further field trials in Uganda are successful, other countries could adopt the scheme and with it provide clean water cheaply while stimulating the local economy. It's science working with less developed countries to make life a lot easier. This patient is about to get an x-ray for a suspected hernia. After the images are gathered, doctors will be able to view them anywhere in the world, thanks to a new computer system. The new multimedia medical record system is set to give doctors instant access to a patient's case notes from wherever they are. Scans like these form a vital part of a patient's medical file, but keeping track of the hard copies is often a hard and time-consuming task. The new system changes all that. Dr Waddy Gredrock lists the advantages of accessing medical records at the touch of a mouse. Rapid retrieval, ability to manipulate the images electronically and of course the ability to transfer the images to a variety of sites from the central store. I could use it at home or wherever I was in the world, he said. The system was developed at the London Imperial College by a team of medical information technology experts led by Professor Richard Kitney. The software is easily installed in any hospital with an intranet system. It's a simple idea that modern technology has made a reality. The way that hospitals store and retrieve medical records could soon be revolutionised, bringing benefits to patients and professionals alike. With technology like this, all we need to do now is stop people getting sick Seems at all. Too much there. Keep And finally, it's thought an injured humpback whale may have entered Sydney Harbour in search of a sanctuary after being hit by a ship. National Parks and Wildlife Services staff in a boat were monitoring the condition of the 10 to 12 metre adult humpback, which is the size of a passenger bus and could be seen swimming near the mouth of Sydney Harbour. Spectators were warned against stressing the whale and were urged not to get within 100 metres of the stricken mammal. The whale appeared to be swimming freely despite wounds to its back. A transport spokeswoman said all Sydney ferrymasters had been warned that there was a whale in the harbour and told to proceed with caution. She said the humpback had not affected the running of ferry services. Ken Eastwood, a staff writer at the Australian Geographic Journal, said in New South Wales between June and July, humpbacks travel north from the Antarctic waters to their breeding grounds in the Coral Sea off Queensland. They travel up the coast for a couple of months to warm waters to breed, he said. Late in the afternoon, the whale headed out to sea, possibly responding to the calls of a pod of four whales just outside the entrance to the harbour.